Today, we're taking a look at the Armstrong Whitworth Argosy. The Argosy was the first of three airliner designs that the company built for Imperial Airways during the interwar period, the other two being the Atlanta and the Ensign. Despite its blocky appearance, the Argosy was one of the best success stories to come out of the earlier years of commercial aviation following the First World War. Its origins can be traced back to the early 1920s. In 1922, Imperial Airways issued a new specification for a transport aircraft for its Middle Eastern routes. The specification had an emphasis on range and endurance, calling for an aircraft powered by three air-cooled radials with a range of 500 miles and the capability of flying against a headwind of 30 miles an hour. The choice of three engines reflected a growing trend in civil aviation, as the emerging airlines of the day strove for increased safety, and this would be cemented by policy in 1925 when Imperial Airways mandated that they would only use multi-engine designs moving forward. Seeing the potential of the commercial transport industry, Armstrong Whitworth submitted a design for what would be their very first airliner, and considering their lack of experience, it was fairly ambitious. It was a large, three-engine biplane with a capacity for up to 20 passengers, and although Imperial Airways had abandoned the initial Middle Eastern specification owing to changes in routes and other developments, they considered the Armstrong Whitworth proposal for their European routes. In response to this interest, Armstrong Whitworth finalised the design and submitted it as the Argosy. It was a typical example of post-war construction, which is a nice way of saying that it was a flying rectangle. It was big, blocky, and not hugely majestic no matter what way you looked at it, but it would prove to be reliable. The angular box-shaped fuselage, which carried a biplane tail with three fins and rudders, was of steel tube construction covered with fabric, and the wings, except for the centre section, were of wooden construction, fabric covered, and had ailerons on all four planes. Both the top and bottom centre sections had steel spars, the top one being supported above the fuselage on tubular steel struts, while the bottom served as part of the support structure for the undercarriage and engines. These engines were direct-drive Armstrong Siddeley Jaguars, which initially produced 385 horsepower and drove two-blade propellers. The fuel was stored above the fuselage between it and the upper wing centre section, and this gave the aircraft a range of approximately 310 to 330 miles, depending on loading. The two-wheel undercarriage consisted of two V-struts under the wing engines, each having oleo-damped coil spring shock absorbers, and the axles were hinged to a pyramid of steel struts under the main part of the fuselage. Moving inside, the cabin section of the fuselage had a wooden floor which also served to brace the structure, but doped fabric was used to line the walls and the roof of the cabin, which in consequence made it somewhat noisy, particularly for the passengers who had the misfortune of being sat abreast of the engines. Two pilots sat side by side in the nose of the aircraft, 20 passengers were seated in the spacious compartment measuring 29 feet long, 4 foot 6 inches wide and 6 foot 3 inches high, and there was a central gangway through the middle and an opening window beside each seat. At the rear of the cabin was a lavatory, and behind that a large baggage compartment with an exterior door. Another smaller baggage compartment was also located under the pilot's cockpit, probably to store mail and other light parcels, though there isn't much information on what it was exactly used for. Following review, the design was approved by Imperial Airways, who ordered two aircraft in 1925, and a third was ordered and financed with the support of the British Air Ministry. The first aircraft was complete in under a year, and it made its first flight on the 16th of March 1926, with Imperial Airways test pilot, Captain F. L. Barnard, at the controls. Initial flight testing ran through until the 24th of March without incident, though little details on their actual results can be found, and by this point the second Argosy had also flown. This one became the first aircraft to be accepted by Imperial Airways, the date of acceptance for the original seems to be unknown, 
and the third Argosy, financed by the Air Ministry, was delivered in March of 1927. As was tradition for the time, these three aircraft were each named after cities, and they were called the City of Glasgow, the City of Birmingham, and the City of Wellington, which would later be renamed as City of Arundel. City of Birmingham made the type's first commercial flight, taking passengers from Croydon to Paris on July 16th, 1926. In October, the city of Glasgow was demonstrated before representatives of the Dominion Conference, who were suitably impressed by its imposing size, and it received a favourable report in Flight Magazine, which stated, The way this machine leaps off the ground and climbs, almost like a scout, is truly amazing. The Argosy was off to a good start, and things quickly got better when Imperial Airways took a look at their balance sheets. The Argosy resulted in a significant boost to their traffic figures, particularly on the London to Paris route, where it could carry more passengers than its French rivals. It was also cheaper to operate. The cost per mile travelled for the Argosy was just 9 pence, compared to 14 for the Handley Page W10 and 21 for the de Havilland DH34. As the Argosy had the roomiest cabins of the Imperial Airways fleet, it was put to use in testing a more luxurious service in the spring of 1927. Known as their Silver Wings service, this luxury lunchtime flight from London to Paris boasted a cabin steward and a buffet. The service operated in both directions, departing at noon, with a flight time of around two and a half hours. The fare for this journey was quoted at £4.15, and shillings, a full £1 increase from the fare of the ordinary morning service flights. A less successful venture of the Argosy was its use in an attempt to supplant the rail services that were heading up to Scotland. This took the form of a race between the city of Glasgow and the famed locomotive the Flying Scotsman. This took place on the 15th of June 1928, with the aircraft departing from Croydon and the train from King's Cross. Making intermediate stops to simulate planned stops along the proposed air route, the Argosy only made it to the aerodrome outside Edinburgh 15 minutes before the Scotsman pulled into Waverley Station. Unsurprisingly, no more was heard of the suggested air service to Scotland, at least until aviation technology had somewhat improved. Meanwhile, the Argosy had thoroughly impressed Imperial Airways on their European services. Operating routes to Paris, Brussels, Cologne and others, the Argosies had tallied 4,862 flight hours by mid-December of 1928, which was the equivalent of some 437,000 miles of air travel. For the 1920s, this was a significant achievement, all the more so as the Argosy became the airline's first aircraft that truly paid for itself, thanks to its cheap operating costs. This success resulted in a follow-up order for three, quickly increasing to four Argosies by the end of the year. These became known as the Argosy Mark II, and they featured a number of improvements. The engine was now a Jaguar Mark IV-A, which was geared and produced 410 horsepower. This new power plant, combined with an increased fuel capacity of 360 gallons, increased the Argosy's range from 330 miles to 520. The Argosy Mark II also featured innovations such as automatic wingtip slots and a different method of operating the ailerons via servo flaps. These flaps, which looked like small rudders, were pivoted on the ends of outriggers, which themselves pivoted on a vertical axis positioned between the wing spars. Though somewhat untidy in appearance, it allowed control loads to be adjusted to varying degrees of lightness without the risk of overbalancing, and it also provided some measure of automatic stability, in that any side slipping caused the servo flaps to apply corrective forces to the ailerons. The four Mark II Argosies were delivered in 1929 as the City of Edinburgh, the City of Liverpool, the City of Manchester, and the City of Coventry. Following this, the original three Argosies were also re-engined with the Jaguar Mark IV-A as well. The Argosy would find itself in service until 1935, 
During this time, it would feature in some of the prominent milestone events that marked the expansion of British commercial aviation. It was one of the first aircraft used in the first Empire Air Mail route, which ran from London to Karachi, and it also featured in the first route from London to Cape Town, with the Argosy operating on the 1,000 mile leg from Cairo to Khartoum. On one occasion, the Argosy also flew royalty. In 1931, the city of Glasgow, with its interior suitably modified to be more stately, took the Prince of Wales and Prince George from Paris to the Great Park at Windsor. After many years of service, during which no passengers had been injured at all, the one and only fatal accident involving an Argosy occurred on the 28th of March 1933. While en route from Brussels to London, the city of Liverpool caught fire in the air. After descending from about 2,000 feet, with smoke pouring out of the rear of the cabin, the fuselage broke in two and the aircraft crashed, killing all three crew members and the 12 passengers. From the evidence of the wreckage, it was clear that the fire originated in the lavatory, or in the extreme rear of the cabin, and Imperial Airways concluded that the cause was either deliberate sabotage or an accidental blaze caused by a passenger. Either way, the fabric coverings of the cabin certainly increased its flammability. With the larger Handley Page HB42 entering service, the Argosies were brought back from the African routes in 1933, and they were finally withdrawn from European services in 1934, being considered obsolete. The last to see active use was the city of Manchester, which was sold to United Airways in July of 1935, who used it for joy rides until the end of the following year, after which, at some point, it was scrapped. Though not built in huge numbers, the Argosy had been a big success for Imperial Airways, and a huge success for Armstrong Whitworth, seeing as it was their first airliner. But the airline's experience with the Argosy, and other three-engine designs, had proven that this number of engines did not provide complete immunity from forced landings due to engine failures. And so, Imperial Airways sought out newer four-engine designs, and Armstrong Whitworth would produce the Atlanta. But that's a story for another day. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you, of course, to the patrons. Now, I've run into a couple of last-minute roadblocks with the next two planned videos, so the schedule for the next week or so may be a wee bit chaotic, so just stay heads up on that. A big thank you, of course, to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier members, I don't really have anything else to update people on this week, honestly. It's all gone by in a bit of a crazy blur. So I just wanted to say thank you all once again. Your continued support has been absolutely amazing. And I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.